say if you'll come down and sit with the, your attorney there. <coughs>
eventually Carly comes back in after Ashley's taken some items out of Carly's room. Carly walks back in and notices her mother is in the bedroom and then proceeds to walk in the direction where uh, Ashley and Heath's bedroom is. You see her come back into view of the camera. She has her hands concealed behind her back out of view, view of the camera. Um, she looks into the kitchen and then proceeds to walk into her bedroom and then you hear a gunshot, a scream, followed by two more gunshots. Um, Carly proceeds to return to the kitchen, concealing her hands behind her back. You hear a heavy object being set down on the uh, counter and then she proceeds to get Ashley's phone and begins texting on it. Do you know who she was texting? I believe it was Heath based off of the text messages that he received. When the text messages did appear that she was the first day her dead mother? Yes. And what was the substance of those texts? Essentially asking about how long it would be till he got home. Uh, on the video, is anybody else besides No further questions, Dan. Where was the 
It was inside the residence, to my knowledge. And did you take that into evidence? No, because it didn't have an external SD card. After speaking with Mr. Smiley, he said that there was no footage that could be pulled off of it. Did you finger print? No, sir. No, ma'am, sorry. And when did you first speak to Brooks? Later that evening. What did you think about that? The date that it occurred. The 19th? Yes, ma'am. When did you first learn that there was a second person in the home? When we met with her at the sheriff's office. Yeah, Your Honor, I've got an objective to this line of question. I realize we got into this on direct for purposes of bond, but if that's just for purposes of bond, I'm not sure how much this goes to, unless this is for argument as to bond, I'm not sure it goes to probable cause. I'm going to let you go a little bit beside that. I don't need a whole lot on this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yes. And when did you first meet with Brooks? It was approximately 8 or 9 o'clock that night. I'm not sure the exact hour. Of the March 19th? Yes, ma'am. And how did you learn that there was a second person in the home? She had come to the sheriff's office with her father. And were you aware of this? What, if any, statements did Mr. Smiley make to you about Carly's state of mind at the time of the shooting? I did not speak with him directly. I know an investigator went with him to the hospital, but he was extremely distraught, and it was hard to get anything out of him due to the circumstances. The only thing that we really have is what he told the initial deputies about how he had been shot, and then his stepdaughter was the one that had done it. Have you met with Mr. Smiley since his release from the hospital? Yes, ma'am. And did you have any conversations with him at that time? Yes, ma'am. And at that time, what did he tell you regarding his stepdaughter's state of mind at the time of the shooting? He said when he walked in, he was met with a gunshot, and that he wrestled over the firearm, and that Ashley had, sorry, Carly had fallen backwards, and that her eyes were really big, and he said it looked like she had seen a demon or something to that effect, and she was screaming and then ran off. Did Mr. Smiley also make statements to you regarding Carly didn't seem to recognize him? It's something that he said he believed that at the time that he thought that maybe she had thought that there was someone trying to break into the house, something to that effect. And did he also make a statement that Carly did not seem at the right time? Something to that effect, like she had seen a demon. Also, isn't there a recording of the incident between where you can hear from the video camera in the garage Carly and Keith's confrontation in the house? Yes, ma'am, so I love it, yes. And how would you describe Carly in that video recording? You can just hear screams. You can't see anything. So I was not sure who the screams were, if they were Heath or Carly, but there was screams. He asked Carly what's going on, something to that effect, and then that's the end of the audio until you see her run off. Does he also make a statement in that audio recording where he announces, Carly, it's me? I believe so, yes. So does that seem to imply to you that he did not believe she recognized him? Your Honor, object. I'm going to call for speculation. I'm sorry. Object is to speculation. Yes, it's speculation. And to your knowledge, what medication was Carly taking at the time that this occurred? Your Honor, object has to relevance. Your Honor, it goes to our argument for bond. Okay. At the initial date that this occurred, there was no knowledge of her taking medication. At the time that she was arrested, it was later found out that she had been on some prescription medication. And do you know what prescription medication that was? Not all of it. I believe she had been taking Lexapro. And do you know how long she had been taking Lexapro for? It was to my understanding she had changed it at the end of the week beforehand, but not sure the exact date. The end of the week before the incident? Yes, in the prior week, yes, ma'am. So somewhere around Thursday, Friday before the incident happened that Tuesday? Yes. Is that accurate? Yes, ma'am. And is it also true that when Carly was found half a mile down the road from the scene of the crime, she actually turned herself over to law enforcement? Well, they saw her and stopped and asked if she was the girl that was involved in the incident up the road, and she said yes. Had she flagged law enforcement down? Not to my knowledge. I believe they just spotted her. And how long were the investigators, how long was the crime scene inspected and secured before you turned it over? Your Honor, I'm going to 
object as to relevance. I'm not sure if this has to do with probable cause or bond. What is the relevance of the Your Honor, it just goes to all of you for bond that I think we could just ask is there, is there about the crime scene. I don't think it has to get into the time of that. I'm going to sustain the objection. Are you still investigating the crime scene or has that been turned back over? At the residence? It's been turned back over. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. What else did Brooks tell you in her statement? As far as what? Essentially that she had gone over to the house and that she didn't know what she was going there for. That she had showed off her dead mother and then asked her to go outside and she was about to, that he was about to be home. When did Brooks leave the residence? At the same time the call we did. So Brooks was there at the time of the shooting? She was in the backyard. And he says that there was a recording that showed Carly singing to her dog after she had apparently shot the mother? Yes, ma'am. Who else did you talk to in regards to this investigation? Your Honor, again, I object as to relevance as probable cause. Mr. Spade. Your Honor, I'm wondering if anything else with Carly singing doing the video footage between the 45 to 50 minutes it took between the first shooting and her stepfather to drive home. She comes into view in the kitchen, gets the phone, starts texting what we believe is Mr. Smiley, then walks back into her room and then she walks back in and appears to let the dogs out and the camera gets unplugged. So it was just a few minutes prior. There wasn't a whole entire duration of the interior camera. It shut off a few minutes after the shooting occurred. Thank you. Where was the mother's body found? In Carly's room. And how many gunshot wounds had she sustained? Three. Three. And where were those gunshot wounds? She had one, two inside of the face and one underneath the chin. And were you able to recover the bullets? Yes, ma'am, two of them. Well, the projectiles. And how many bullets were you able to recover from the crime scene overall? From the crime scene, there was some fragments that were shot at Mr. Smiley that were recovered. And then there was none of the one from Ashley that was recovered. The other two were recovered during the autopsy. But all three bullets that were fired at Ashley actually made contact with her? Yes. And how would you describe the bedroom in which Ashley was found? Objection again as to relevance, Your Honor, as to probable cause or to bond. What is relevance? Your Honor, we're just going into part of their investigation and questions as to whether or not what's being described to us has been in line with information from other witnesses. Well, you know, this is not a discovery opportunity. This is a preliminary hearing and a bond hearing. So I'm going to sustain the objection. And do you suspect anyone else at this time had any involvement in the shooting? No, ma'am. Any further questions, Your Honor? Ms. Berry, you're re-read. Just one follow-up based on her cross-examination. What, if anything, did the defendant tell, I believe it was Jordan at the jail? When she was provided with her paperwork to shut her bond, she made something, a statement to the effect of, 
Oh, you can kill somebody and pay a lot of money and get out of jail. No further questions, John. You should. I played every Nothing other than argument, John. Okay. All right. At this point, uh, <coughs> in the rules of you know, civil or criminal procedure as it relates to preliminary hearings, we'll get into the bond here shortly, uh, but specific rule of criminal procedure 6.2 dictates that uh, at the close of the prosecution's case, which is, ha has happened now, which includes the cross-examination of the prosecution's witness by the defendant, which also took place, the judge shall determine and state on the record or state in open court whether the prosecution's case established probable cause. Uh, so that's where we are according to the rules at this particular point. Uh, Ms. Gregg is charged with count one First degree murder that she had feloniously caused death to Ashley Nicole Smiley. Uh, charge two, attempted murder that uh, she did attempt to cause death to Heath Herndon Smiley by shooting him with a handgun. Uh, those are the two charges. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the standard burden of proof uh, in a preliminary hearing uh, is just what is reasonable. Uh, based on the testimony of the investigator, uh, I do believe it's reasonable to believe that the crime of first degree murder has been committed. I do find it reasonable to believe that the crime of attempted murder has been committed. I also find that uh, it's reasonable to believe that uh, Carly Madison Gregg committed the crime of first degree murder. I do also believe that it's reasonable to believe that Carly Madison Gregg did commit the crime of attempted murder. Uh, I am therefore going to find that probable cause exists on both charges to proceed in this matter by Ms. Gregg over to wait the actions of the grand jury. That being said, uh, the rules of criminal procedure at this point dictate that the defendant may then make a specific offer of proof, including the names of witnesses who would testify or the defendant may produce the evidence offered. So uh, uh, as far as it relates to the probable cause hearing, do you have anything at this point? No, Your Honor. Okay, that'll conclude the preliminary Hearing in this matter now, we will uh, talk about why. So, uh, either uh, Ms. Todd or Mr. Coleman, whichever one of y'all wants to argue uh, your line argument.
evaluation on Carly, uh, is currently out of the country once he was uh, returned on April 22nd. As a court manager, he's a very well-respected psychiatrist who works with children uh, in the line cinema. Uh, so, also, Your Honor, since Carly has been detained, her medication has changed twice. And these are not these blood pressure medications. These are not health one has included a mood stabilizer since she has been detained. And that was after she reported hearing voices. Again, the detention center is not equipped to deal with that. It is a nurse practitioner who prescribes the mood stabilizer, not a psychiatrist. Secondly, Carly is not a threat to the community at large. Carly's family, Lynn's stepfather, who was indeed a victim here, would attest that he does not believe Carly will be a threat to him or to anyone at large, but she does need help. Secondly, there is no charge worse than murder. So once you're charged with murder, I don't see a charge of tampering with evidence causing you to flee jurisdiction. It comes down to the one there. Um, also, with proper restrictions, Carly would not be able to leave the confines of a residence. She would have no means of transportation. Detention confinements were not having a cell phone so that she could not communicate with friends. All of this would keep Carly restricted. And again, to hear Carly in the protected community from whatever concerns there may be. But Carly is certainly not a flight risk, and she certainly doesn't have the funds to raise the current bond. But she needs more help that can be offered to her in her current incarceration account. Thank you. I'm assuming, uh, Ms. Todd, it's fair to say that the family of uh, uh, Ms. Gray that sits behind you, could I just see a hand of the family members? Uh, is it fair to assume that family members, your argument, you can put your hand up. Is it fair to say, well, let me ask you this way. Anybody that held your hand up, if you disagree, with anything Ms. Todd said concerning Ms. Craig. Anybody of the family disagree with Ms. Todd? Okay, that's right, I just want to be sure. All right, um, well, there's several reasons uh, for uh, Bond, and I feel like I've been instructing today more than I typically do, but uh, Bond is not intended to be a punishment in and of itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a balancing act, and that's why uh, I tell people all the time, it's a lot easier for me to follow the rules uh, as it relates to these matters uh, because they're all so factually different. Uh, as the state pointed out, Mississippi Rules of Criminal Procedure 8.2 uh, dictate, uh, it talks about the right to release, which is in subparagraph one, uh, and it talks about uh, that there are several reasons for release. Uh, one, it has to, we have to be assured of the defendant's appearance as required or that the defendant's being at large will pose, whether it poses a real and present danger to others or to the public at large. And in that calculation, it goes through 15 different um, items that need to be considered, uh, which I'll briefly go through uh, for purposes of the record. Uh, Ms. Gregg is 14, about to be 15, and she's not already. It's her, it's her birthday in April. Uh, she does, uh, I, I do appreciate her, her intellect and her success at Northwest Rankin. She clearly has a lot of family ties and relationships. Uh, so I think uh, that factor one would weigh to the benefit of Ms. Gregg. Uh, the second one is the defendant's reputation, character, and health. I have found or heard nothing that would uh, be a negative connotation as it relates to Ms. Gregg, so I would find that that be a, a neutral factor. The third factor is the defendant's prior criminal record and any releases on recognizance or bond in the past. There have been none of those things. Uh, those would be to the benefit of Ms. Gregg. The identity of responsible members of the community who will vouch for the defendant's liability. We just had a show of hands of family members. There were numerous family members here who support uh, Ms. Todd's argument. Uh, about the, uh, the issue of bond, uh, that, that factor would weigh in the benefit of Ms. Gregg, uh, whether uh, violence or lack of violence in the late commission of the offense, 
Well, that's uh, significant. The, the violence is significant. Uh, not only is the, uh, the best evidence today, the testimony was that the violence to, with, with the mom was uh, to such an extent that there doesn't appear to be any great argument prior to. It just it seems to me that uh, the defendant walked into her bedroom where her mother was and shot her three times, twice in the head. So, uh, and then laid in wait. I uh, played with the dogs, laid in wait for nearly an hour, waiting on stepdad uh, to come in, uh, and then shot him multiple times, or shot at him multiple times, striking him at least once. So violence uh, is pronounced, the violence is significant. Uh, that clearly weighs against Ms. Gray. The nature of uh, item six, the nature of the offense charged, uh, the apparent probability of conviction and the likely sentence, uh, in, insofar as these factors are relevant to the risk of not appearance, uh, it's a murder, it's a first degree murder charge. Uh, it is an attempted murder charge. Probability of conviction is high. The likely sentence uh, is gonna be significant. Uh, I understand because she's a minor at the time the events were uh, committed that uh, there may be some leniency on the back end of that, but in any event, uh, the likely sentence is gonna be uh, long term uh, and they are relevant to the risk of non appearance. That factor would weigh against Rig. The type of weapon used, it was a handgun uh, used here. Uh, I believe it sounds like a revolver, but in any event, it doesn't matter. Uh, it was a handgun that was used against uh, both, both victims. Uh, number eight was uh, the threats made against victims or witnesses. That's not applicable here. Number nine, the value of property taken is not applicable. Number 10, whether the property allegedly taken is not applicable here. Number 11, residents of the defendant, including consideration of real property ownership, think of residents in the defendant's domicile. Uh, Ms. Gregg is a Rankin, Rankin County resident. Uh, she's too young to own uh, real property, uh, and I would assume she spent most of her life here, but at least uh, we know the last couple of years apparently. Uh, that factor uh, really is a, a neutral content. Number 12, the case, the case where the defendant is charged with a drug offense, that's not the case, so that's not applicable. 13 is consideration of the defendant's employment status and history. Uh, we have, as Ms. Todd pointed out, she's 14 years old. She uh, has no employment. Uh, she has no uh, work history, so that's a neutral factor. Number 14, sentence enhancements, if any, including the charge in the charging document, which we don't have at this point. Uh, 15, any other factor, circumstance bearing on the risk of not appearing from the danger to others or to the public. All right, that brings me to Article 3, Section 29, which the state has made a tennis motion to deny bond uh, to the defendant. Uh, and Article 3, Section 29 of the Mississippi Constitution uh, indicates that uh, you know, in paragraph two uh, and three, paragraph two dictates that if a person is charged with committing an offense is punishable by death, life imprisonment, or imprisonment for one year or more in the penitentiary, uh, and that uh, and that upon hearing finds probable cause that the person has committed a felony by mind. That really doesn't apply, that's paragraph two. We'll go to paragraph three, the charges of offense punishable by imprisonment for a maximum 20 years or more, or by life imprisonment, which is certainly applicable here. A county or circuit court judge may deny bail for such offenses where the proof is evident or the presumption great upon making a determination that the release of the person arrested would constitute a special danger to any other person or community, or no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the appearance of the person is required. I do believe that uh, Ms. Gregg does pose a special danger uh, to others. Uh, I, I, I mean, I know the family knows her better than I do, but uh, the heinous nature of the crime, uh, the uh, premeditation that seems to have been involved here uh, is pronounced, uh, it's, uh, it's severe, uh, and it, it does concern me, it does concern me that uh, there is a danger to Mr. Reagan, whether there's a mental component to this or not. Uh, I think anybody could argue that if you're gonna kill another human being, then there's going to be a mental component involved uh, in, in most of those crimes where someone is murdered. Uh, but anyway, uh, the uh, particular facts and circumstances of this case do cause me pause. Uh, while I do appreciate the state's uh, petition or, or argument uh, about denying provide, I'm not going to deny bond. I 
under Article 3, Section 29. Uh, so I am going to bond guidelines, which is the Mississippi Rules of Criminal Procedure 8.2C, or bond guidelines, which the which the state provides, which are presumptively reasonable. The defendant has made an argument uh, for an unsecured bond, which is completely inappropriate uh, on a murder charge. Uh, an unsecured bond would be you could have absolutely no money, and they would have no skin in the game, as I call it, uh, for appearance purposes or risk purposes, so that would be clearly off the table. Uh, 8.2C, the bond guidelines dictate that for a capital felony, the bond uh, guidelines are 25,000 to no bond or no bail allowed. Uh, manslaughter or any other non-crime, non-capital crime involved, but involving the loss of human life, ten thousand to a million dollars. Uh, you know, um, it's easily, and then the non-capital offenses punishable by maximum of twenty years or more, twenty thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Million dollars is on the high end of the range, but it is within the range. Uh, I, I, I have some compassion for. The, uh, the defendant's particular status in life, being young and being exposed to this, uh, I do find that uh, I do believe that it is difficult to be in isolation 23 hours a day. I, I get that. I, I don't think I don't think I would enjoy that either. Uh, but uh, as the state points out, when you commit crimes uh, of this nature with the violence uh, involved in this crime, uh, with proof being so uh, so heavily weighed against the defendant, even at this point, uh, that. Uh, there is uh, too much cause for concern on my behalf. I'm gonna leave the bond uh, at the upper end of the range, which is a million dollars uh, at this particular point, and I will be open to uh, anything changes down the road. If we end up with more information, more facts, Mr. Uh, Todd, I'm happy to revisit the situation later. If, if we have different facts that come up, different circumstances or different things that we know about uh, as they exist today, uh, so uh, I am going to set a bond uh, at a million dollars uh, collectively for the two charges. In addition to that, were she to bond out, uh, she can she must appear in court when required and comply with all the orders of the court. She has to notify the court of any change of address. She cannot commit any other crimes, which usually is the one that trips people up. She cannot possess be in the presence of weapons of any kind. She has to uh, uh, be involved in an online school system. Uh, if she is, if she does make bonds, she has to obtain an alcoholic drug assessment and comply with those recommendations. She cannot consume alcoholic beverages, illegal drugs, or misuse prescription drugs. She can have uh, no contact uh, with uh, Heath Smiley uh, until released by court if she makes bond. She also has to obtain a one-piece no-cut fiber or GPS ankle monitor. Uh, and in that monitor, she has to keep it operable and charged at all times. If she has a passport, she has to surrender it to the circuit clerk's office within 48 hours of release. She has to buy by court order curfew of 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And until final disposition of the case, she has to maintain that GPS monitor. She will be subject to continuous bond monitoring by court watch or correctional counseling of Mississippi. And she has to continue to follow the directions of the mental health uh, physician, uh, these are all assuming that she finds out uh, at this particular point in time. All right, uh, but that disposes of those issues today. Anything else besides? Your Honor, other than she's not allowed to be visitors uh, while at the detention center. However, I believe the maternal grandparents would like to yes. visit and her. All right, I'll tell you the same thing uh, I told Mr. Walker a while ago. If, when you leave here, uh, if you go behind the jail to and hit the intercom button, talk to Jordan, and just tell Jordan you just left out of here. I talked to Jordan in the hall earlier. He understands there's a large presence of family here. He's going to try to accommodate uh, some limited contact at that point. So go try that, and for whatever reason that doesn't work, let Anita know. But, but we're aware of that. We're going to try to make that happen. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Perry? That's it. That's just for today, correct, Your Honor? Yes, sir. All right. Okay, that'll conclude uh, the uh, the matter in 24 dash 15875 Yes. Hi, Mr. Powell. Yes, Ron. How are you, sir? Good, Ron. Come on up. <laughs>